welcome on the Sunset Safari. My name's Brent. I've got Brian and the thumb on camera. Uh, we have Eugene and Nikki in final control, and James and Andrew on the other vehicle. Welcome here to Juma private game reserve in the Saabi Sands, South Africa. Um, we are on a live safari, so everything we're seeing, you're seeing at the same time as us, we're also interactive. So you're able to ask us questions about what we're seeing out here in the African bush. You can do that by emailing to... Oh, sorry. Game drive radio making a bit of noise. Um, you can do that by emailing questions at wildearth.tv or you can uh, just use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So for those of you who might have missed the Sunrise Safari uh, this morning, uh, we were lucky enough to find Shadow's Cub uh, out near Impala Plains. I think James is going to head into that area see if he can find, uh, find it this afternoon. And we're going to try to follow up on those mysterious female leopard tracks we were following. Uh, so hopefully we have some luck. Uh, it's a really nice warm afternoon here. It's about 28 degrees Celsius, which is 83 degrees Fahrenheit. A lovely winter's day here in Africa. Uh, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy. And please feel free to send as many questions as possible. We really do appreciate getting them. So let's go see what we can find. So in the beginning of the drive, you might see me use uh, the game drive radio a bit. Uh, that's just so we can all figure out where everyone's going, uh, so we're not covering the same area and maximizing our chances uh, at finding those animals. So we're going to head into that area where we last had those female leopard tracks this morning, uh, before before we decided to head off to go have a look at that young male leopard. sort of general game species are going to be resting in the shade, especially the ruminants chewing the cud. And as it cools down, we'll start seeing a bit more movement from animals. Oh. And hopefully, a bit more movement from the, the cats. Nicely now. Um, the colours on the trees are almost all yellow on the ones that are busy losing their leaves. Uh, some of the marullas still have a few leaves left, but not for too much longer. Uh, and definitely, my favourite time of the year in the bush is the dry season. From a tracking point of view, it makes the tracks a lot easier to see. Also, from an interaction between predators and whatnot, with the grass being a lot shorter, uh, your visibility is much better, so you do get to see so, uh, some incredible interaction at this time of the year. Not to say it's not there during the wet season, it's just a little bit harder to find.
guys were on the Sunrise Safari. Um, I heard there was a little bit of confusion about that Stevens beaked bar uh, blind snake. So if you are interested, on my Twitter account, I did post a picture and its full name in that. So you can find it there. Um, the Stevens beaked blind snake that we saw on the Sunrise Safari. Nice. Let me just go back a little bit. Beautiful big tree. Uh, the road in this area is actually named after this big tree. Uh, quite a unique tree. Uh, the little tree to the right is also of the same species. Um, but magnificent tree. Um, the seeds can be used to make firewood. You can see it behind that little combretum. There's the big tree at the back with that very distinct twisted trunks. So the, the oil from inside the seeds of this tree can be used to make a fire torch. Uh, that's a, a little hint for you. And it has really big, big thorns. We'll get up a bit closer. It's actually one of the only trees I think I've never ever actually seen a leopard in. But you don't really want to be barefoot under these guys. You can have a look at the leaves now. So, who can tell me which tree this is? Very distinct tree. And you can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag SafariLive on Twitter. Very beautiful tree. almost uh, pale uh, and a bit hazy and that's quite common because you can see as you go higher in the sky it gets a bit, a bit more blue uh, and that's from all the dust uh, and fire at this time of year oh wonderful well I remember I said I would come back to find the zebra and it doesn't look like they've moved very far at all How many can we see here? I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. At least seven, possibly a few more hiding in the bushes. Now I know I, I spoke about short grasses being good for animals. Here we have a nice good example of a of a browse, I mean of a grazer on these short grass plains at the edge of a sea line. Zebras are hindgut fermenters. Um, that means they always look like they're very full and very good condition, uh, which is not always the case. One of the ways to tell when a, a zebra is is has dropped condition is their mane. Uh, it stands very very upright most of the time, but if um, their mane will actually fall in, in in certain parts, and that's to show. Uh, that they are, that's one of the signs that says they are not in good condition. There you can see those two, the mains are perfectly upright. Uh, so, all in good health by the looks of things. Uh, mother in a fall. Oh, I think we might get a little roll. Zebras love to roll in the dust, and that looks like a good spot there. Oh, not today. Oh, there's some more at the back, so... 
two, three, four, five, six, seven. I can see eight. Could be a few more even. The one to the closest to us on the right is the stallion. Much thicker neck at a quick glance. Let's get a little bit closer. The grass is greener down the road. See if we can get a bit closer now. There's also a herd of impala with them. Now, if you look quite carefully. You can see where the zebras are feeding. If you look at the grass, we zoom in on the grass in the center there. You can see, compared to the other grass around, there's quite a bit more green. Uh, and that's why they are feeding this area, and that's why all the impala are feeding in this area as well. So there's water that's moving naturally under the ground there, uh, and that's what's causing this grass to remain green a bit longer than the grass away from the seep lines. So you've got, we've got a bachelor group of impala and zebras feeding, on, uh, feeding in this area. Well done, Deb, Kathleen, Meg, uh, on getting the correct answer, and Julia about getting the correct answer uh, for the torchwood tree that we just saw. It's uh, called the torchwood or uh, green thorn. That is the name of that tree. Uh, the road we were on where the, it's named after is called Balanites Road, which is the beginning of the Latin name for the torchwood. I know a lot of the regular viewers will know I like to play a few games with you guys, um, specifically to do with collective nouns. So, who can tell me what the collective noun of a herd of zebra is? So, what is the original collective noun for zebra? The more common, the used one is a herd, but there's an original colonial collective noun for zebra that's quite fun. So who can tell me what the collective noun for zebra is? You can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or just use the hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter. We can 
see the zebra and impala feeding on these short grasses on the edge of the seep line before it goes into the drainage line. There are the two foals. So I think we'll leave the zebra and impala to feed on and we're going to go try find those female leopard tracks again. I was trying to roll past the bush. Not quite enough. A lone wildebeest bull. Also utilizing these short grass plants on the edge of the sea plants. Looks like he's making his way towards where the zebra are slowly. Um, when we saw saw them this morning, they were actually together. Uh, when we shot past them to try to get to that leopard, um, and there's quite an important reason for that: is that uh, wildebeest and zebra uh, are very different types of grazers. Uh, a zebra is what you would call a bulk grazer; it eats most grasses indiscriminately where and most length of grass where there's a wildebeest is a very specific type of feeder and actually needs animals like uh, zebra and buffalo that are bulk grazers because they are very finicky feeders and will feed in between and only picking certain species at certain lengths Oh, lots of general game on these short plans today. Cynthia and Sue 
and you guys were the first uh, with the answer to that dazzle of zebra, dazzle of zebra. I think it's quite fitting, all those stripes. Oh, hello. Little one. Standing still for now. Little male Steenbork. Oh, he's got a itchy bum. So Steenbork, quite interesting. If you can see carefully under his his eye, it's a pre-orbital gland there. Um, there on both eyes you can see them. And those are very important for Steenbork for marking their territory. Uh, to keep to keep other Steenbok out, they live in very very small territories, only about uh, at two hectares, and they will defend them quite vigorously from other other Steenbok. Because they live in such small territories, they they bury their feces um, to try hide mask their presence in an area from predators. Um, they also um, are monogamous; they do mate for life. Unless obviously one is one of the partners is killed, and another very interesting thing is they are not water dependent. They can survive uh, without drinking from the moisture they get from what they eat and from the dew in the early morning. So I'm quite sure the female will be somewhere around here, quite close. Walk so quietly, always listening. So their name is actually a derivative from an Afrikaans word, which is a buck stern or a stern, which is a brick. They're called a brick antelope. It was one of their defensive mechanisms uh, against predators, is to keep dead still. They'll sit down and keep as still as a brick, basically. Or so. And uh, I've actually seen wild dogs sniff within 30 centimeters of them and with them keeping still uh, the wild dogs without them moving the wild dogs didn't get that chase trigger and they just completely moved on from the area and the stand book was completely safe. Okay, I'll we'll leave him. Afternoon foraging, this is a strange looking track up here. the female tracks but there's been so much stuff that's uh, slowing us down so we're going to cross over to James uh, and that's going to give us a chance to get inside here and uh, we'll see what James has been up to and we'll catch up with you a little bit later. Hello everyone, welcome to our afternoon safari. You find me a little out of breath. Um, we have Andrew behind the camera. Uh, he is dressed as a pirate today for some reason. Um, so you can be thankful you've got me in front of camera and not him. Something over his mouth, it's a bit odd. Um, anyway, we've been searching for some leopard back here. Um, and there was a small cub scene this morning, which I think you all saw. Or those of you who were insomniac enough in North America saw. And those who were having your morning coffee in Britain or Switzerland or Finland or somewhere like that. I'm sure you saw him. Um, it was Shadow's cub. And he's, we looked in the area where he was this morning. We can't find him there. And we're now, I'm just going to get Andrew to pan onto some tracks here. I'll try and point them out to you. So he was, he, he was over there. 
down in the depression down there. Um, and he's now, he seems to have come up and around and his tracks have come out of the block and onto the road here where you can see them. Now, I'm not sure, can you see my hand? Yes, Andrew? perfectly. So you can see here is his track, his three little, or his four little front pads and his back pad. And he looks like he's, he's done a, he's come out of the block just behind the vehicle, walked along here. He's come along here like this. And that's where we've kind of lost him. Looks like he may have headed off in there. And so we're going to follow up through there and see if we can't find him. We have done a loop of the area. I just spiked myself on a thorn. This is deeply painful. I'm struggling not to cry. Um, anyway, we're going to go through here and see if we can't pick him up. Um, doesn't look like he's come out of the block at all, although there has been quite a lot of traffic on this road here, so I may have missed a track or two. Um, if I did, it's probably Andrew's fault. <laughs> so we're going to drive very slowly through here, and you can come with us if you like. quite exciting for me because I've never seen this leopard. If you'd like to tell me anything about him, remember the Twitter handle, hashtag Safari Live. If you want to ask me anything about him, you can do it on that way too. Or send us an email. I'm just going to knock Andrew's head off here. Send us an email at questions wildearth.tv Now I believe this leopard is about eight months old and so it's quite unusual that he's not with his mum. She's probably out hunting uh, and it's unlikely, if she, if she hasn't come back to fetch him, it's unlikely he'd have gone far from here. But it's also very likely that he's lying quite low. I initially expected him maybe to be in some tall tree, and um, that's often what young leopards will do if they're waiting for their mothers. But there's nothing really appropriate in this area. There are a couple of knob thorns, um, and lying in a knob thorn just sounds very uncomfortable. So what we're looking for is probably in the deep shade, lying low in some thick grass. What we don't want to do is freak him out. While he is quite relaxed clearly around vehicles, um, he will be quite easily frightened if we're not careful. So the tracks were heading off in this direction to where we are now. Quite open here, so probably not ideal habitat. Can be around here. From the look of his tracks, he's not a very big fella yet, so you'll find it quite easy to hide from us and our human eyes. Something like this sort of shade off to my right here is where I would expect to find him, um, but you never can tell. The textbooks will always tell you one thing, and just when you think you've got a handle on it all, the animal will do something completely different. mound over there which I'm just going to go past 
and then we'll probably go back out onto the road and see and sort of do a wider loop if you like. And that'll be cover a bit more ground. Fortunately, it's nearly my right eye. It's nearly my left. a species that we just flattened called Acacia exuvialis, or the flaky thorn. Plenty more where that one came from, so fear not. termite mound off to the right here that I was yeah, looking at. Maybe in the shade of that quarry bush. Okay, nothing here. So we're going to go back out onto the road slightly wider loop and then see if we can't pick him up pick his tracks up there in the meantime we'll get your your intellectual juices flowing I know you know what those are so have a you can tell me what they are first and then you can tell me what they're used for A couple of obvious ones. Beautiful four-winged fruit. Dispersed by the wind. Many hundreds of which, oh, I see, sorry, Andrew's, Andrew is signaling to me wildly <laughs> to tell me that my earpiece has fallen off. Right, I think I'm back online. just joined us welcome it's good to have you here have to ask where you've been never mind we'll forgive you this time we're searching through the grass here for a, a leopard cub who is about eight months old I've never seen him so I'm quite excited to see him and for those of you who were here in the morning uh, he was found around this area apparently he is shadows cub I've never seen either of them to look for is just to see sort of appropriate places for a small cup to lie like in the deep shade or in a tree can I have a look there with my binoculars I've spotted a stick. Fascinating. Not a leopard. Sorry about that, a, um, a stick. from those of you who know this leopard and where he might like to hide be very welcome I 
I think we're going to try and cross out onto the road and come back to another, approach this area from a different angle. from Susan in the Netherlands. Um, Susan, you'd like to know, welcome to this search for the elusive spotted cat. Um, you'd like to know if a cub of um, this one's age, which is about eight months, would survive if its mother died. Um, the answer is, in this environment, it would be highly unlikely. Um, she's, sorry, I'm just gonna get Andrew underneath this here and stall the car at the same time and so Susan I don't think he would survive just simply because there are too many other predators in the area and he's not able he won't be anywhere near able to defend a, a territory at this stage of his life out here originally seems to have gone back in but he may have found a Franklin to chase or a scrub hare and ended up miles from, oh we've got more tracks here there he goes you see him Andrew? A bit too close to me. He's too close sorry so he's come seems to have turned on and come up the road here and gone in over here well, let's follow the tracks and see where they lead. At the end of them, there must be a leopard, presumably. Unless he's learned to fly. So, Susan, I hope that answers your question. Normally, a leopard will need to be probably about 18 months old before they'll be able to survive on their own. Maybe a year old, but I think eight months, especially for a male, would be a real push. of the marula trees they've got the smoothest bark so they'd be the most comfortable place for a delicate leopardine belly to lie it's interesting that a lot of people think of leopards as being arboreal species or species that live in trees and in places where competition is absent, so there are no hyenas or lions or wild dog in the area, leopards um, are seldom found in trees. And so they'll also seldom stash their kills in trees unless um, there is competition from other predators like hyenas or wild dogs, especially lions. to the question on the seed pods um, which we're going under again a different tree these are the 
The major answer seemed to have some sort of something to do with bush willows or combretaceae, combretums, and that's what they are. Well done, everyone. Um, somebody got it exactly correct. They are, in fact, the russet bush willow. Marlene, you're a tree genius. A, a russet, russet bush willow, combretum hereroense. Named for a Namibian tribe, the Hereros. Why, I have absolutely no idea. and look at the road here and see if he did come out of the block. My bias has led me to the Scotia tree here. Lovely Scotia tree on a termite mound. Hoping there'd be a little leopard lying in it. But alas, there is not. And he really doesn't seem to have come out of the block here at all. So we'll do another loop, we'll keep trying. We shall fearlessly forge ahead. Welcome to the afternoon game drive or afternoon bush bashing as it is at the moment. Um, you've said, does the russet bush willow smell like potatoes? Um, the answer is no, it doesn't smell like potatoes. It actually has a um, sort of very nondescript smell. Um, you can use the pods to make a tea. Um, I've done that. It uh, tastes about the same as it smells, like nothing. Um, but it will, they, the pods do sort of uh, t um, taint the tea with colour, so it looks like, it looks like tea. Um, the bush that smells like a potato is something called Phylanthus reticulatus, or the potato bush. Um, and that's a very distinct, distinctive tree, grows in drainage lines, and smells mainly only at night, um, because... I, I think it's pollinated by a nocturnal moth, and so it only needs to attract things at night time. So only when the temperature drops, especially around this time of year, does it smell. For me, it's a tremendous, um, a tremendous smell of uh, nostalgia, because it's one of the first smells I learnt in the bush. Welcome. Nice to have you with us. Thanks for your question. You'd like to know if the cub is old enough to climb trees at this age. Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, leopards will start climbing trees from almost as soon as they come out of the den. So probably.
normally from not much older than a month, they'll start to climb. And Andrew took his hat off. going to sit here for a few minutes and have a listen. Um, often what happens is we bash around in the bush like this and we don't hear anything. And the birds, especially things like the drongo, will alarm call when they see a leopard, uh, as will the sticklers or the helmet shrikes or the battises. And so if we drive around, we bash the trees over and we have this noisy engine revving, we often don't hear the birds. Of course, there's nothing but stony silence from all birds at the moment. All we can hear is the gentle rustling of the wind. the wind through a camera doesn't sound quite the same as it does in reality. So what's quite pleasant for us is probably a bit of a grating noise for you. Right, nothing going on here. We're going to do a slightly wider loop this time and see what we come up with. I've been tremendously frustrated by the leopards on this reserve since my arrival. They have inspired to make me look foolish. I think Brent also had some other male leopard tracks earlier, so maybe he'll come up with them. game drive ahead of us. They're driving rather too fast to be following a leopard, unfortunately. There goes Andrew's leg. Sorry about that, Andrew. Did you see him this morning? And was he, he was in stationary in the d drainage line, was he? Close to the drainage line. Okay, moving this way. There was a couple of tracks coming in into the block here, so I don't know. We've, we've driven the place pretty flat. Somewhere above. So he's, and I don't think he's crossed out. This side. And he certainly hasn't crossed out that side, yeah. Didn't check any tracks this side. Mm, no, he came out and then he went back in again. So, I mean, are you going to hang around and look? Yeah, definitely. Okay. I'm going to go a little bit further down and then cut across again and see what I can see. Maybe I'll drive this side here and drive a parallel road over here. Okay. So cool. I've got no comms, so... Me either. Okay. I'll, I'll rev loudly if I find it. Or whoop like a hyena. Ooh. Nice to have a few people helping us. This is the proverbial needle in a haystack stuff. They do say perseverance pays, though. 
whoever they are. Mother has come to fetch him, but we would probably have seen her tracks then. up a little bit. I'm going to try and show you something little and interesting. Now, let's have a look here. Sorry, um, you can see there that this thorn has been stung by something called a slender ant. Now what they do, that's a, that's a stung thorn. And this one is not. So you can see how the stung one is swollen. A bit like your skin might swell if you were stung by an insect. And I'm just gonna open this up and see if the ant isn't still inside. No, he's not, he's gone already. But you can see that's where his home is. That's where the lava lives. The lava goes in there and eats out the nutritious sort of pith in the side of the, th in the middle of the thorn, and then goes on his way and bites another thorn and lays his eggs, or her eggs, sorry. Males don't normally lay eggs. Okay, let us continue after that small cameo in the quest for the spotted cat. <laughs> about whether I'm the only one out this afternoon. Um, the answer is no, Brent is also about, um, but my illustrious partner um, has got no, is, seems to have trouble with his communications. So the, something's wrong with his signal and that's why you're not seeing him at the moment. So I'm afraid you're stuck with me for the next little while. tree we came to earlier.
tracks on the road. Sorry, this is just a really nice example here. There's a tree here, Andrew. You can get him. Look close. There's a little scraggy thing there. If you can see the rich, rich red color on it. That's called a red thorn, and that's why it's called a red thorn, because the, the inner bark is a glorious sort of rusty red color. One of many acacias we get out here. And we've got knobthorn acacias, acacia exuvialis, acacia nigrescens, we have acacia nilotica, we have acacia burkii, we have acacia um, erubescens maybe, I haven't seen them here but they should be here. So with all that Latin we will proceed with our leopard. some of the others, freer of trees because the soil is quite sodic or sodium rich and you can see that, um, I don't know if you can see it in your camera, you might be able to it's, the soil is quite white it's quite pale so it's almost toxic to some plant species but some of the animals love it and we'll just see if we can get that bird there turn and blow See if any of you can identify him. Oh, that's beautiful the way he's coming to hover just above us. Glorious bird with very ignoble intentions. to know at what age does a leopard make the sawing sound. Gene, I don't think you're the gene that I know from North Carolina, otherwise you'd definitely have addressed me with a smart comment. Um, but Gene from North Carolina, a leopard can make the sawing sound, it's a very good question, I would think almost from, from puberty. So they're definitely, you can with lions, I know that their, their larynx is not born calcified. So when they're born, they make that very kind of soft mewling meow, meow, meow sound. Um, that's a pretty horrific impression, but something like that. And then as the larynx ossifies or gets bony, um, they so that the sound will get much deeper and they make a, a sort of typical big cat sound. Now with a leopard, it's probably very similar. I suspect around about 18 months, they, the larynx will start to ossify, and so the sound will get deeper, and then they'll start to make that throaty, throaty kind of growl.
of our friends have managed to find him. to give up on me. It's going to tell me it's had enough of the abuse. Nothing there, Andrew, don't worry. Twitter, the resident bird genius for the day. You had correctly identified that bird as a an African harrier hawk um, or gymnogene, the old name, and that is indeed what it was. Here we go. Tracks of the leopard on the road here. over but a lot of traffic here. I'm just going up the side of the side of the road there. Maybe. Ooh, how fresh those are. Will, look, will be very difficult to age on a road like this because because there have been lots of cars coming up and down and so that will create a, a wind which will in turn blow sand into the tracks uh, which would normally be quite a good way of aging them but very difficult in this situation.
we're going to get in here this way. I believe Brent is back online, which is nice. Um, I'm going to let you cross over to him and see what he's got. We're going to keep looking for the leopard, um, and hopefully when you come back to us, we'll have his golden spots in the setting sun. Okay, see you just now. Welcome back. Uh, everyone, sorry uh, we've been gone for so long. Um, we had a, a, a minor radio difficulty, so we had to go get that fixed quickly. Uh, all working now, so off we go again. Um, we did get back onto those female leopard tracks. She actually came all the way down to the edge of quarantine clearing. Uh, we're right on the on the sort of south, southern edge of quarantine at the moment, and we're just having a careful look around here. I mean, these tracks are quite old, um, so. Hopefully she's laying up in this drainage line somewhere and she's going to come out now. It's getting a bit cooler. Uh, other than that, we probably, if we don't get any luck in this area, we're going to go check through around um, the dams, uh, maybe head up towards Buffles Hook and see what's happening in that part of the world. But welcome back. Back and let's get the Sunset Safari going. And thanks to James uh, for holding the fort while we're away.
check the water. It is getting dry. So water is always a good point to look. So we're going to go check the little um, water hole in front of Gallego Camp, uh, then down to uh, Fuyatella Dam, and then onwards and northwards and eastwards towards Buffalo's Hook. This is the beginning of my favorite time of the year. Um, I probably have to say my favorite time of the year is, is sort of the end of October, beginning of November. It is incredibly dry, but it's also incredibly warm. And there's very little water around, there's very little grass. So uh, the animals are pushed onto uh, the remaining water points. Your visibility is amazing. A lot of the trees don't have leaves. The grass is very short. So it's a really, really good time to see things. Um, and also from a tracking point of view, uh, tracking of the predators is much easier at that time of the year. this little water hole. We'll be arriving there quite shortly. I'm going to take a gander. There's more than likely some old buffalo bulls there. They haven't started moving yet. It's not quite cool enough, but as it gets cooler, they are going to move away from these low-lying areas around the water uh, and move towards the crests. Uh, there's warm air rises, so these low-lying areas get very cold. Imagine if you're an old buffalo bull, you want to be a bit higher, a little bit of warmth, a bit more comfort uh, during the night. Well, I might have been wrong. Not a buffalo bull in sight. Look at that stunning color. So you've got a Cape Glossy Starling. Just watch as he moves into the light, how there's the iridescence on the, oh, oh, well, he can just fly away from us. We'll move around a bit. That iridescence on the, on the feathers is just sparkling. Now there's a very, why a lot of birds have that iridescence on their feathers um, and it's to do with most things like most things in nature most of the adaptations are to do with either finding food or finding a mate so a starling that loses um, color and can look quite dull uh, is generally a sign with the starlings that they're in bad condition so here we go, walk into the sunlight for us. Um, so it shows that they're in bad condition, but if they're really bright and shiny and that iridescence is sort of vibrant and almost glowing, it shows that the bird is in very good condition and the females will always try to pick the shiniest male. Um, and that's not only in starlings, certain kingfisher species as well also have that, um, but it is really, really uh, visible in starlings. And a very bright yellow eye. They're busy foraging around for insects, and grubs, larvae. You might hear a branch break, let you know that there's some elephants about.
tracks carefully. group of Inyala. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Favorite haunt of Inyala around the edges of these drainage lines. Uh, being browsers, there's a lot more tree species uh, around the edge of dry water courses. Uh, so it gives them a, a lot more options uh, when it comes to the browsing. They are very beautiful antelope. see the tails you can just catch that white under flash of the tail when they swing it to keep the flies away but that flash is very important um, when they're trying to evade predators or warning other things so they'll bark and they'll run and they'll lift that tail and all the other inyala that are around will be able to see that there's a predator around or there's something dangerous around when they lift that tail and that very very clean bright white shines through. So I got there, picked up something small and then dropped it. It's looking for whatever it dropped. It looked like maybe a small piece of bone. Quite a few different animal species will pick up small bits of bone and chew on them. Um, can anyone out there tell me what that's called? Um, there we go. Picking up the bone again. It's got a piece of bone. It dropped it again. There we go. Um, so they do that um, for calcium, but there's a very specific term uh, for that so can anyone out there tell me what that term is uh, you can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv on email or you can use the hashtag safari live on twitter oh another one hop and a skip and a jump through the bush Just move a little bit forward. Picked up there. Very difficult to tell what type of animal that's from, but probably from a small to medium. Um, giraffe to it often. I've seen impala um, and inyala and wildebeest doing it before. Oh, they're about to disappear in the thicket. We're going to continue on. Let's see what else is out there this afternoon. Just remember the question, what is the, uh, the specific term for when a herbivore or a non-carnivore species um, picks up pieces of bone to chew and chews them for calcium? late afternoon light coming through now.
sit on termite pallets. quick that we might catch him inch forward uh, no he's off uh, it was a black crowned chagra that just zooted in front of us about termite mounds and luckily enough we have one right next to us. Uh, Teresa would like to know if there is one particular termite mound that is the largest um, and oldest that we know about um, and she would also like to, she said she's always noticed there's mounds under trees um, and is there specific trees where termites would choose to form their mounds. Uh, well, Teresa, um, I haven't noticed uh, a particularly big one. There are some very, very big ones here that are still active. It's a really nice one to explain this to you. If you have a look at those little bushes growing out of the side of the termite mound, um, it's not so much grivias, those are little raisin bushes. So you will find that a bird is fed off um, those bushes and then they've come to sit on this termite mound. Uh, it's a nice vantage point and then they've defecated on the termite mound. If you go higher up there you can even see there's a little bit of bird dropping on the termite mound where a bird has been sitting on it. So, um, and that puts the seeds and the termites are obviously bringing soil up from down so there's quite a lot of nutrients on a termite mound. Um, and then what happens, it's called succession basically. Um, we'll start off with a few small uh, raisin bushes like that. Um, then you might find that there's a jackalberry seed deposited there by a bird. Now that there's a bit of a bush to sit in. And a, 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 a bean seed. And then, or a timbuti seed. Then slowly but surely, um, the trees will actually colonize the mound. Uh, utilizing the fact that it's bringing up nutrients and that the birds have deposited in there. So that's why you often find trees on top of termite mounds and it's generally a couple of different species that are favored um, by birds to eat. So Teresa, I hope that um, helps you there uh, with your termite mound question.
called Treehouse and uh, oh, Twin Dams and Treehouse. Um, did have tracks with a, a male leopard, looked like a young male leopard crossing out at Treehouse Dam um, this morning. So hopefully he decides to change his mind and come back. tip here where the signal might get a bit bad uh, and then I'll start talking again on the other side. And Sharon, they were the first two to get the, the question correct about um, herbivore species chewing on bones. And the correct term for that is osteophagia. Osteophagia. Well done, Pamela and Sharon. wonderful late afternoon light especially now when you've got the different colors in the trees uh, and you can spot the evergreens a mile away at this time of the year you just see this bright green bush sticking out like these quarry bushes on the left here Sunset Safari. Um, Carrie is asking whether there are any crimson breasted shrikes in this area. Unfortunately, not. They occur further to the north, north of us, where it's even more, more dry and more arid. They are an arid species, so unfortunately, we don't get any crimson breasted shrikes here. I'm just going to stop for a second and listen. Oh, very, very important. Uh, when looking for animals to just use your ears for a couple of seconds. And while we're here, we're going to do a little, a little another tree quiz. Uh, while we're here, there's this little tree directly in frame in front of, in front of us now. Um, if we zoom in on that, we'll have a look at the bark. Which one? This little one here. So yeah. So if we come up, you'll see the bark is very distinct. And then you'll see as we you can see the thorns starting to creep through. Don't go, I'm sure that cross it to Okay, copy. Here we go. 
So it's a small tree species. This is actually quite a big version of this tree. Normally it stays a bit smaller. Um, and it's got nice big thorns and a very distinct bark. So who can tell me which tree this is? Uh, you can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv. Um, and or you can just use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And the last little clue about it is because I've said this before, it's to do with its Latin name. I always say you have to be very exuberant to tackle it. That is the tr that is the, the clue for that. You have to be very exuberant to tackle that tree. towards a bad signal area again uh, so if we do have any breakup I apologize <laughs> getting better and better. We need to find an animal to put in it. Especially, it can occur in quite thick stands. You have to be quite exuberant to jump through an exuvialis. Um, well done, Raisa.
also we had uh, another a lady known from Simone in Midrand, South Africa. Welcome Simone on Sunset Safari and Simone also got it correct and with the Latin name as well. Acacia exuvialis. sun's dipping low it's time for the predators to start moving so fingers crossed um, we're gonna start slowly making our way towards Buffalo Dam uh, while we do that we're gonna cross over to James uh, and see what he's been up to and we'll be back with you a little later welcome back to Giga everyone um, as you can see, we are not looking at a small spotted cat, but a large um, cud-eating bovid, a.k.a. the African buffalo. Um, tracks of that leopard wandered off into um, the next door property. We do have a bit of access there, um, but we're going to pop around there sort of as the sun goes down. We're going to make our way there from here. Um, and just see if he doesn't pop out um, as, the, as the darkness falls or as the twilight comes and the edge of the heat comes off the day. It hasn't been a very hot day, but it's certainly been warm enough to lay a cat out on the ground. And so as it cools down, we're hoping that that will, that will change slightly. We seem to be doing quite a lot of the finishing our evenings off with these buffalo. We're certainly spending some time with them. I think they're rather magnificent creatures. You can see there that <laughs> that ox pecker there has got his head almost inside some sort of cavity in the buffalo. And what they do is they don't eat the ticks because they're friendly, kind creatures, these ox peckers. They eat the ticks because of the blood. And so if there's a wound, if there's a slight cavity or slight wound, the ox peckers will generally try and keep that open for a while because it provides an easy source of blood for them. But they do, they do clean the wound of sort of infection by doing that. So it's not entirely bad for the poor old beefalo. These chaps are looking particularly forlorn about life. Um, I say buffalo look at you as though you owe them money. These ones just look very depressed and in need of a strong dose of Prozac. I suppose they're probably feeling depressed about the fact that their life as big mating bulls at the head of a huge herd is, is over and they have nothing but a retirement of grass and mud, water and ox pickers to look forward to. Still, things could be worse, I suppose. <laughs> I wouldn't mind that life. As you're probably aware, they're called Daga boys or Ndaga boys. The word Ndaga is a Zulu word um, and because we normally broadcast to the world's geniuses. I'm going to ask you if you know what Ndaga means. Um, it does tend to be slightly bastardized depending on where you're in the area that you're in, but it is a Zulu word. And of course, Zulu is not the native language in this area. Um, that is Shangan or Tsonga. Um, I know there was a bit of a debate over what those, whether those two languages with the same thing. Shitsonga and Shichangan are pretty much the same language. But Isi Zulu is from Natal and not from this area. But we still call these these old buffalo Daga boys or Umdaga boys. A Bafana Bom Daga. Right, we're gonna carry on because despite the fact that they're standing up, they're not exactly high energy action these buffalo so we're going to head back gently around to where the leopard tracks were to see if we aren't lucky those ox peckers as opposed to 
opposed to the yellow build variety, which we do get here sometimes, but more commonly in the north. Got a glorious golden light that is starting to bathe the bush. Listen carefully, yesterday we spoke about the bearded woodpecker. You can hear one knocking in its territorial da -da 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 on the hollow tree just nearby. Let's see if it does it again. I hope you caught that. Do you think they had that? Yeah. That's wonderful. So, so that's the bearded woodpecker. I'm just going to show you a quick picture. Um, and he's one of the four woodpecker species that we get in the area. Remarkable things. I mean, if you were to bash your head against a tree at that sort of velocity and made a noise like that, you'd be concussed for weeks. Um, the woodpecker is able to do it because they have a spongy sort of shock absorbing substance around the brain. So they don't, their brains, that's the bearded woodpecker there. Um, this, these are not really to scale. He's quite a big fellow. Um, you can see the male is distinguished by his red head and the female by her lack of a red head. They will both they will both probably do the territorial call or territorial tap. So their brain is shielded by um, a sort of spongy substance that absorbs the shock as they smash their heads against hard wood. Very unadvisable for you to try as a human being. say that the the senses you know it's very easy for us to transfer the sound and the sight of this area to you but the the feelings or the the feel of the air and the on the leaves and the vegetation the taste of the happen to come across some lion dung uh, which is likely to strip the paint off smells all the time, especially at this time of the day. We do our best to describe them to you. idea here of this plant. Now this plant has a fairly nasty Afrikaans name. But because it's its real name, I'm going to tell you what it is. Um, in... Does that work for you, Andrew? Far enough away? That's perfect, yeah. <coughs> Um, it's called a Bushman's grape or Cissus cornifolia 
And in Afrikaans, it's called perdipus, which means the urine of the horse. Um, I've ridden many horses in my time, and I suppose its smell is quite like the urine of a horse. Not very nice. And that smell is it will defend it from grazers. But the fruit is actually very delicious when it, when it comes in the late summer. Cissus cornifolia, the Bushman's grape, the English name being far more attractive than its Afrikaans counterpart. And that certainly is a common theme. We're going to cross back to Brent, who thinks that his sunset is prettier than my sunset. Um, he's very aesthetically skilled as our Brent. So we'll cross back to him, and I'll head over to the leopard tracks, and we'll see you just now. Welcome back, everyone. Um, Brian and I have made it to Buffalo Camp. Unfortunately, no cats or predators, but it is actually an absolutely stunning setting at the moment. Um, Buffalo Dam, which has been devoid of buffalo for quite a while, as you can see over my shoulder, is no longer devoid. And they're probably not going to be around the dam for too much longer. I've seen some of them have started already moving away. And they're going to move up towards the high ground um, on the crests where it's a bit warmer uh, during the, the evening. Can you hear the oxpeckers? They just landed on the, those buffalo there. See them on the back. And as always with buffalo, lots and lots of flies. You can see that one's not in particularly good condition, uh, quite old. You can see that hip bones are starting to show. And if we look at his tail, zoom in on his tail there, please. I didn't notice that earlier. There's a wound. There's a wound there. Uh, difficult to see what it's from, from this distance, but I can see it's been bleeding recently, um, and that's more than likely from the oxpeckers. There we are. you can see that he's getting annoyed with the oxpeckers, because not only do they eat uh, the, the ectoparasites like ticks, they will often eat blood, so they will keep a wound like that open uh, on, on an animal. And this guy's very, very relaxed. see that coloration on the horns and that's from rubbing against trees and you can just see that, that mass of moving flies on his horns battle score battle scarred old man Wonderful time of the day. And there's the hippo. Getting ready to sit on a night foraging, I'm sure. Be in search of grass. Just think when we were here on the sunrise safari, we could actually, it was so cold we could see his uh, breathing.
Yeah, some more buffalo on the opposite bank. But very quiet, I can hear a Franklin. Sounds like some canaries as well. But not much in terms of bird life or animal life in, in sound. You see, those are the ones that have started moving up already, away from the water's edge. They'll start moving towards the crest of the hills. And I think these guys are not going to be too far behind. So if um, might have climbed in a little bit, uh, we are sitting at Buffalo Dam at the moment. We've scoured we haven't technique. We're basically going past all the different water holes and seeing what we can find, um, and hoping we find some tracks and here at Buffalo Zook Dam we found a young male hippo and probably about 25 or 30 old buffalo bulls um, that have come down and spent the day here. Oh, right. It's one of your favorites. Hovering. Here we go. There's a pied kingfisher. It's hovering above the dam, trying to get the last meal before it gets dark. Amazing how they can hover like that, looking for s small fish. Oh, into the sun. Literally into the sun now. Oh, he's come out. He's off to the left. Ah, we all lost sight of him there. We've got... Come on, catch something. It's actually almost directly above the hippo now. I'm trying to see maybe if there's little fish eating, feeding off the hippo's feces. Darting around the dam, just trying to find a, a last meal before. Night sets in. Like the fish are not being that cooperative this evening. Whoop, sip, sip. Just on the edge of the sun. Isn't that exquisite? Oh, almost. Pulled out at the last second.
such a beautiful image. Uh, sun's dipping down, kingfishers giving up. And now the sun's just about to disappear below the horizon. I'm quite sure a lot of these old buffalo boys are going to be moving on quite shortly. Blair. Uh, Blair from Canada is saying, is the Birchall starling and the Cape Glossy starling the same bird with two different names? They sure look alike to her inexperienced eye. Well, isn't that amazing that buffalo is deciding to cross right through the dam? It looks like the other, and another two are going to follow suit. Isn't that beautiful? That sort of golden water shimmering off the wake made by those buffalo. The hippo watching on behind. Well, Blair, to back to your question about the starlings. Um, fortunately, um, there's a virtual starling here. So to answer your question, they are definitely not uh, the same species with different names. Um, there are different species. The Cape Glossy Starling is a bit smaller uh, than the Birchall Starling. Also, the color is very, very different. More green, where there is the Birchall star, a sort of lighter uh, emerald green, where is the Virtual styling is sort of more blue-green. Um, if you have a look on the opposite bank there, just behind that buffalo, there's a virtual styling. And you can see when he pops his head up, but a very distinct black eye. So you notice that black eye, and it's very much sort of a blue, a much more blue-green than, than a green-green, if that makes any sense. You can see a dark face mask um, and a black eye. And if we look at a Cape Glossy Starling, you can see what I was referring to there. Number one is the Cape Glossy Starling. So it's sort of very green. It lacks that black face mask around the eye. And also it's got that incredibly uh, yellow eye, or orange eye. Um, and then if we flip across, and you see there, like the one we've just seen next to the buffalo, the Birchalls, um, that black face mask. It is bigger and it's got a much longer tail and it's also got much more blue coloring on it than the Cape Glossy. So Blair, I hope that helps you to, in, to distinguish the starlings in the future. Um, I think the sun's popped over the hill. We're gonna leave this wonderful setting uh, and see what else we can find.
going to make our way off to the next point to keep up the water thing. Um, and we're going to hand over to James, uh, see what he's been up to. I'm pretty sure he's still uh, fighting the good fight, trying to find you guys at Leopard. Uh, and we'll catch up with you a little later in drive. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to shout now. This is the tree that I expected to find the leopard in. As you can see, there is no leopard in this tree. Um, so just instead of hearing me blether at you from the front of the car, I thought I'd climb in here. We did eventually find some more tracks that came in off the road and through this area and we've been checking it down through the marula trees which are on top of the crest because that's the most likely place for a young leopard to be sitting um, otherwise we're here enjoying the rather marvelous sunset so you're now going to have the honor of seeing me probably break my leg as I come down from here and then we're going to head off just down through this crest where the the marula trees continue back on the road and towards an area where we saw some male leopard tracks earlier and we're hoping maybe when the sun's down he might pop out all right here i come sure. i survived Right, can't work this radio, so it shut up. Okay, on we go. So the tracks came in sort of from behind us there into this general area. But as I said earlier, the leopards of this region have made me look a fool more than once. you know that Andrew may be climbing that tree. <laughs> the other reason to leave the area at the moment, of course, is that once a going on there, can you get us to the trees there, Andrew? A little bit forward, a little bit forward. Take a screenshot, everyone. Stick it on your wall. And into my face favorite time of the day. And the energy of the bush just picks or changes to the night. And the immense peace of the changing of the guard fills the air. It's like the earth is sighing all around. We've had a, 
an answer to our question, the word umdaga. Uh, somebody or a few, few of you have come through and said it means mud, and that is absolutely correct. I wonder if any of you know how to spell it, though. I'm not going to tell you. So as I was saying, it just feels like the earth is now breathed out from the, I wouldn't say tension of the day, but it's breathed out and it's almost going to breathe in again a different kind of energy for the night time. And you can't feel it from where you are. Maybe you can, um, but where we're sitting, where Andrew and I are sitting now in the middle of a block, there are no roads anywhere near us. We can just feel a sense of from the earth around us. It's just a magnificent feeling. So we're going to move gently on around, back to the road, and then down and around. settle with our presence and then I'll get a bit closer. slowly closer to him. I don't know this leopard as well as many of you do, so I'm not sure how relaxed he's going to be. But let's just sneak slowly closer. And again, I'm just going to reiterate that we won't put a light on him because he's on his own without his mum. possible not to approach him front on. The Land Rover's got two big eyes on the front of it, but from this angle it's going to be difficult. So we'll try to go in at an angle.
Isn't that magnificent? So, from where we were thrashing around in the bush early this afternoon, he's about 150 meters. We were on the wrong side of the road. As I said, the traffic is quite a lot on that road during the day, so we missed his tracks. Someone else from just next door found them and told us where to look. And so we came in on the tracks, hoping to bump into him like this. I think if I hadn't fallen, dropped the Land Rover into that hole, he wouldn't have sat up and we wouldn't have seen him. Just let him settle for a while. And we'll try and get a slightly closer view of his face. Um, I wonder if anyone there on the in the Twitter sphere, it's a very modern word for me, or anyone online can tell me what his spot pattern is. Okay, he's got quite a complex spot pattern. Um, just to reiterate for you, as he sits up, look at him there. This is an eight-month-old leopard, um, apparently called Shadow. Or Sh Shadow's cub, um, still in his mother's territory, no doubt. You can see he's a little fellow. He's got three or four spots on the right hand side. One, two, three. Three spots on the right. Gorgeously, he blends into the bush there, heading towards the termite mound. Right, we're going to follow up for a little while. As I say, it's starting to get dark, and I mean, we've had a wonderful sighting already. vehicle's moving because he's a cub I don't want to put too much pressure on him so I'm just gonna let the other vehicle stop first before I move again yeah you can see he's he is he is feeling slightly threatened so while the other vehicle stop we'll move
And this, of course, is the best possible light to be watching a leopard in. And where we can see color there, many antelope will see a, um, a level of color, but probably much less than we do. Oh, look, he's found something to stalk. And so that color that he is will be almost invisible to something like an antelope doubled up against that termite mound. tree that he's standing underneath is a knob thorn with very nasty thorns on it as I say we don't light uh, <laughs> well we don't light young leopards well some do it's probably fine he's you know he's almost old enough to be lit side once they've moved it seems to be a little bit of concern in the Twitter sphere that he may have moved too far from his mum uh, the answer is no um, they will move I've seen sort of eight months to a year old leopard they'll move quite widely from where their mothers leave them Remember, their ears are exceptional. So when their mothers get back into the area, they'll give a contact call, a little grunt, a little ooh, ooh. And that'll be audible to that leopard from a very long way away. And they'll find each other like that. and welcome to this spectacular sighting at the end of the glorious African day. He would like to know if Shadow, who is his mother as far as I understand it, would leave him uh, and go quite far away. The answer is yes. She would use, she would go to the extent of her territory, which could be up to uh, probably, <coughs> probably 150 hectares or so, which is quite a lot. And so she she would go she would go all over that area, but like I say, she won't she won't leave him for more than say two or three days at a time. They can go without food for up to two two or three days, more likely twenty four hours.
You can imagine if he puts his head down there, that'll be the last you see of him. So it'll be very difficult. Had he been lying there earlier on with his head down for anything to have come past and seen him. His major threats on his own like this without his mother would come from lions or hyenas, both of which he could escape quite easily by climbing a tree. And I mean, he would even go into that fairly nasty knob thorn if he had to. He's not, he is also, of course, extremely fast. Fascinating updates you've sent me. Thank you from apparently the inimitable Brent Leo Smith managed to get some photographs, close-ups of his face today um, and confirming that the right-hand side is three spots and so is the left. So a three-three spot pattern. Thank you very much for that and well done, Brent. Uh, the little lens on my camera, I'm afraid, would barely get that, uh, get that termite mount in frame. Do you mind just zooming all the way out of the That to me is just a wonderful, wonderful example of how gloriously they're able to hide. You would blunder past that a hundred times without seeing it. Just his little ears sticking up through the glass. Grass, sorry, not glass. Thanks, Andrew. This is tested. How easily would you see that if you didn't know it was there? That's pretty much the view we have with the naked eye. like a lion they've got those black tips to the back of their ears black and white pure black and white are very unusual colors in the bush and so that black color is a following mechanism most likely that allows him to follow his mother and likewise try and get another view but like I say I'm not going to get too close to him. He 
he's <laughs> he's now stalking us. <laughs> Isn't that spectacular? Hello, fella. Oh, what a magnificent animal. Look at him. Just learning the world. Finding his way. big stretch before he comes down. Ooh, elegant as only a cat can be. I'm actually going to see if my little camera won't take a picture of him. Standard photograph coming up. Brent, read him and weep. <laughs> oh dear, we can just about see him. Change me at stop. would like to know if this leopard came across other young leopards would they fight uh no nigel well you'd never give a categorical answer with anything like this but chances are they wouldn't fight no what they would do is size each other up highly unlikely that they would given that they're in their mother's territories and their mother's territories are almost exclusive um so no they wouldn't fight if they if say they met on the border of the territories they may well uh, have a, quite a playful interaction but at this stage before puberty it's highly unlikely that they would fight remember a, a leopard will do almost everything it can to avoid a fight even as an adult simply because um if they get injured then that's the end of it so if you live in a group like a hyena or a lion does then you can survive uh, being in a fight because you can eat from what the others in your clan or your pride or your pack uh, catch. But a leopard or a cheetah, if they get injured, that's, that's it for them. They won't survive because they won't be able to hunt. And because they're solitary, they can't hunt. And because of that, their characters have evolved so that they will avoid fighting as much as possible. still see his spots going off there. How's it going? But no game drive com, sorry about that. I knew, I knew, so it's fine. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sure. Anything you know of that thing in the rear vicinity? Nothing. Nothing. No. No. Is uh, the stop on Super B? No. 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 Okay, there's a couple of uh, breakaway guards there. Okay. Okay, cool. All right, then. All right. see ya. I said I'd keep it to a two-vehicle lock. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll pull out. I'm going to pull out right now. Okay. That was another game drive. He 
you saw in the picture earlier. We met somebody just now who was was out here simply because they had seen some of the wonderful things that uh, we've managed to find on Safari Live. We just met a guest on another vehicle who came here specifically because of Safari Live, which is very exciting. Okay, I think we're going to leave them now. Um, there's just quite a lot of activity. It's got dark, and like I said, I don't want to shine a light on him. Unfortunately, I didn't manage to take a, a Brent-beating photograph with my little camera, so that'll have to wait for now. But we've had an incredible evening with him. So we're going to pull out onto the road, and I think we'll cross back to Brent just to see what he's managed to find. And then I'll catch up with you just before the end. Welcome back, everyone, to a magnificent African evening here on the Sunset Safari. Um, Brian and I are just keeping really quiet and standing by in this area. We're trying to listen um, for any sign of alarm calls or that. I'm convinced that that female leopard that whose tracks we're following this morning is somewhere in this area. So we've just been sitting quietly here, um, enjoying the m wonderful view, uh, and just waiting to possibly hear uh, any alarm call that it's the right time of the day for her to get moving. Still think we're gonna probably try another loop around the area we think she might be. But we're just gonna sit still for another minute or so and uh, just listen to the sounds of the evening and hopefully we'll hear some alarm calls in that. So we can hear some Franklin. They're not alarm calling, unfortunately. Blacksmith left wing somewhere. But Franklin definitely the most dominant call at the moment. Okay, guys, we're gonna get on the road again. We haven't heard anything. I think Brian and I are gonna keep with that water, water theory and try um, some of the small water, so that small water hole in front of Vuyatela, uh, Teller, oh, sorry, Gallagher again. Um, we have a question from Meg in Boston. Uh, hi, Meg, welcome on the Sunset Safari. Nice to have you with us. Um, Meg would like to know, uh, what are my favorite areas in, um, Arethusa and in um, Juma. Whoa, Meg, that's quite an interesting question. I have a, I mean, a few favorite areas. Let's get my spotlight out. Um, so, Meg, I'll start with uh, Juma. I think probably my most favorite area in, in Juma two of them and they're not actually on the roads. You can only walk there. Oh, 
Oh, it's from Pala heading down to the, the safety of the open area. Um, it's there's a, a section of a lot of little drainage lines um, filled with beautiful Timberti trees and whatnot. Um, in between Mumba Road and uh, Ledwood Road, but it's very difficult to get a, a car in there. And it's really, really beautiful place to walk. So that's probably um, my favorite, one of my favorite spots on Juma. Uh, another one would be the northern side of the drainage line below uh, the Kuyatela Dam wall. Is an beautiful section with the really big jackalberries and stuff. Again, not on the road, but we have driven through there a few times um, following animals. And then, I'll keep it to three. And just a really, really beautiful spot. And I've had such yeah. success with um, finding leopard and lion in that area. Oh, I think I see a bush baby. There you go. He might have been in the tree behind this one. Did a push baby vanishing act. Yo, Dion, I'm trying it. You want to? Hey, uh, how's it? I really do love this just after sunset. And we're going to find something to that we're going to find something walking down the road towards you. It's big cat time now. Convinced that that female leopard is somewhere in this vicinity. I've checked twice already. But it's really I mean, I've checked twice already, already. But it's always but really important at this time of the day to keep um, checking these areas. Um, and especially at this time of the day, kind of start um, when uh, it is likely that they're going to start moving. Who's it? Back to the rest of the question. Um, my favourite section of Arathusa. Um, must definitely be the Marikiri drainage, uh, that area where we saw um, the Tingana male leopard with that impala kill a few days ago. That whole section along that drainage line. And we have a bush baby jumping. Oh, they're so quick. And the disappearing act. It was a little lesser bush baby, not a particularly relaxed one. They're all getting out to go foraging at the moment. So my, and then the next area I really like in Arethusa is on the crest, uh, sort of between the drainage line that runs into the dam and their southern boundary. It's a road there called Central Road, and it's wonderful, mature, uh, broadleafed woodland on top there. And again, big terminalias and leadwoods and um, marulas.
arrive at the water hole. And nope. wondering uh, how flash photography might affect predators. Um, I think there were some flashes going off um, when you were with James and, Sha and that young male leopard. Um, Andre, it doesn't affect them at all. Uh, it's really not a problem. They absolutely do not mind it at all. Uh, it doesn't affect their behavior or their movements. Um, so not a problem at all. You don't get as nice photographs, um, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, rather than using the light of the spotlight. But in terms of affecting the animal, uh, not a problem. the day you're almost always looking around the next corner just waiting to see one of the nocturnal mammals cruising around towards the Jewa Dam Cow. Maybe a little bit more luck in that direction. the sunset safari. Kathleen would like to know, are there still chameleons around? I have not seen any for a while, Kathleen. I think um, the cold weather has set in and I think we're going to have to wait until it warms up again to start seeing chameleons. You never know, we might get lucky and find one or two later.
just checking the top end of the, the dam here in this drainage line. Hoping maybe she might be heading down out this direction, but unfortunately not. Listen for a few seconds. In, um, from Angie in Ohio and the Dayton's Children Cancer Unit. Um, uh, all the nurses uh, are wanting to thank us um, for putting a smile on the children's faces. Um, we want to thank you guys for allowing the children to be able to watch that and we couldn't think of anything better than spreading our love and passion for the African bush and wildlife um, with those very very special kids thank you very very much angie we do really do appreciate it this is why we do what we do and are able to come and share uh, the african bush with all of you thank you very much for watching and to all the kids out there i hope you guys get better soon and you guys got to keep watching and when you get better you're gonna have to come on an african safari so uh, we've got a few more minutes left. Um, we've scoured this area where I've thought um, the female leopard was possibly. Um, I'm still convinced she's in the area somewhere, but she's just proving a little bit too elusive for, for me this evening. But uh, definitely be trying again tomorrow. Um, and from Brian and myself here on the Wendy, uh, it's been a wonderful afternoon we haven't had the best luck with the big things but that sunset buffalo look down was just splendid and thankfully we've had james bearing the brunt and having to do the hard work for us um when we had a bit of a technical difficulty and he came through and found uh, that young male leopard so really great uh to, for james on the other side and we've had a wonderful time driving around trying to find animals it doesn't matter if you don't see anything out here it is a uh, the most special place in the world and I love being out even when there are no animals out um, but hopefully our, our, our predator luck will change a bit tomorrow and we'll have a few more of them around hopefully those lions that were roaring on the sunrise safari uh, are moving back towards this direction or even the Nkahuma pride which I know is quite far away um, they apparently have gone way north so from Brian and myself out here Thanks very much for joining us, and we can't wait to go again tomorrow with you. Uh, so wherever you are in the world, have a wonderful day, or morning, or evening, uh, and we'll see you soon. Welcome back, everyone. Um, as you can see, night has fallen in Africa. Um, I'm sure you saw that with Brent. Um, Andrew and I are still flush with the uh, sense of victory after that magnificent leopard and we're just making our way slowly back to camp and seeing what we can see on the way. Um, talking to you and shining the spotlight is 
something of a difficulty for me because I don't multitask very well. But what I do want to do is show you uh, my award-winning photograph that I took. Um, so I'm just going to stop up here and show it to you. Um, it's not really award-winning. I'm just going to show you the sunset that we managed to see. Here is my enormous camera. Isn't that pretty? There's the star. Move it a little bit back. Yeah. Beautiful trees. So I do have a camera. It's a very small little fellow like that. Uh, not quite as large as Brent's, but then Brent is a larger human than I, and therefore wields a larger camera. I hope that you've had a good time with us this evening. Um, Andrew and I were just discussing whether or not hard work actually pays off out here. Um, and Andrew was deciding that it didn't until we, we managed to find the leopard eventually. And what a great sight it was. Um, I suspect that he will spend much of the evening where he was in that area. He'll move much less at night without his mum. Um, she may or may not come back to, to fetch him tonight. Um, as Andrew asked me, she, he said, will she stash a, uh, the prey in a tree or, and then go and fetch him, or what would she do? And that's precisely what she would do. She'd, she'd kill something, hang it in a tree, um, or hide it under a bush if it was something very heavy. So it was something like an adult male impala. She would probably disembowel it and then try and take it up a tree or leave it under a bush um, and then go and fetch the cub and hope nothing had come to take it. And like I say, in areas where leopards are um, or experience competition from predators such as lions and hyenas, they will normally try and hoist kills if they can. They can lift up to their body weights up, up a tree, but say an ad ad adult male impala will weigh more than she does. And so they should struggle to get it up a tree. Um, you know, the lights of Brent in the distance. Um, we're just going to pull onto the clearing here, see what we can see, and then I shall greet you for the night. Yeah. Hit something there, huge puff of dust. I think I hit a termite alarm. I hope the termites were further underground than the car was. You can see the last embers of the day there. It's going to stop here for us. Turn the lights off so that you can experience the final bits of the night. So you can see the dying embers of the African sun there set over the Drakensberg mountain range to the west and the changing of the guard has happened so all around there are a few night jars calling hopefully some lions later t tonight and we'll try and find them in the morning for you so I hope you've had a good time tonight thanks for all your contributions They've been much appreciated. We've had a great time and we'll see you in the morning.